Hello and welcome to the Nausea Cast. The Nausea Cast is where we go through each movie made and produced by Studio Ghibli in release order, and we discuss our analysis and research findings. You've already heard it. Uh, I added the word produced, sneaky as I am, because this is, I think, the only case of Ghibli producing a movie that isn't in, made in-house in Japan at Studio Ghibli itself. We are talking, of course, about The Red Turtle, released in 2016 and directed by a Dutch person called Michael Dudok de Witt. Um, you know, the, the production itself is kind of like European, so let's just say it's a French, Dutch, English, Hungarian production, something like a that. Belgian, Belgian, there's, there's some Belgian. There's some Belgian in there as well? Okay, beautiful. I mean, we have... We have a lot of Benelux, we have a lot of Europe. Uh, we'll get into that during the production detail. But first of all, of course, you can always find the Narsikas on Lipsyn, on uh, Spotify. Uh, you can join our Discord and you can give us money on Patreon. All those links can be found in the description of wherever you listen to this podcast. Okay, so I, I want to introduce my small, cozy little cast of co-hosts for today because here with me are Platon Skull. Uh, hello, hi. I'm here to uh, not say a single word in honor of uh, this uh, dialogue-free movie. And you already failed. And also, I need two words from you. Pronouns. Oh, uh, he, him. Perfect. And we have Hipster Cthulhu. Uh, he, him, and coming in from my eldritch ocean palace, I've been washed ashore with uh, two other uh, co-hosts. Beautiful. Uh, did you send the red turtle after this poor man? Um, I'll, I'll leave that to the audience interpretation. You know, you can't. This again, in keeping with the theme of this movie, uh, we're not going to make anything absolutely clear. Just kind of suggest it. So I'm going to imply various things. Okay, perfect. And you, of course, have me, Nyard, uh, also he, him, and uh, yeah, that's that's us. That's the crew. Welcome aboard to this uh, seafaring uh, castaway story. Well, not much, much, not much seafaring going on actually. Yeah, it's more like an anti-seafaring movie. <laughs> like, all attempts at seafaring are, are, are resoundingly destroyed. Well, it depends whether like swimming along with some like supernatural turtles counts as seafaring. That's one thing we definitely need to get into when it comes to discussing the symbolism of the film. But I think the first question that is on everyone's mind is. How the hell did Studio Ghibli end up producing a, a, a European animated film? What happened? <laughs> well, funny you should ask that, Nyard. Um, so, uh, Michael uh, Dudok de Witt, uh, you know, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, Dutch, born in uh, the, uh, the region of uh, Utrecht in a, a small town. Uh, went to went to art school, had some supportive but not like artistic parents. He's not a, not an industry baby or anything. Uh, became uh, became an illustrator, animator. Made uh, like uh, I think he's made award winning commercials. Though at this point, he's obviously mostly known for his uh, you know work as an animation director. Um, specifically, uh, in uh, in the year two thousand, he released. Uh, a, an animated short film called Father and Daughter, um, which uh, won the uh, Academy Award for Best Animated Short uh, that uh, uh, that year. Well, uh, the year after, because, you know, you honor the previous year's movies. Uh, which, fun fact, that was actually also the year of the uh, the first ever uh, Best Animated Feature Film Award was, uh, was given out, uh, which, of course, went to uh, Shrek. Um, so uh, duly deserved though <laughs> absolutely yeah so um Platon, i know you to be a bit of an uh movie movie buff so you know a lot about the academy awards you once told me about every best picture winner of all times so talk to me about short films at the academy awards i don't think i've ever engaged with anything about it i don't know any of the other award winners what's happening there is, is that like i think that's a huge honor and like a big thing to get it obviously but just you know give me a sense for what's going on there usually well yeah so uh short films uh aren't that big of a thing today uh it's uh it's mostly like uh student films or other smaller directors uh finding their like breakthrough by by getting some you know uh, some recognition at uh, at short film festivals and uh, and then 
uh, an Academy Award nomination uh, and especially a win can be like a big like uh, breakthrough uh, for for a director. Uh, a, a lot of like famous directors and especially uh, a lot of like um, like uh, horror movies start out as short films, um, which uh, which and then get developed into into uh, feature length, for instance. Um, I mean, historically. Uh, way back when they started the Academy Awards, uh, short films were much more uh, common as like part of the uh, like movie going experience. You'd, you'd have some the shorts and you have the feature, and that was like the night out of the movie, uh, you know. And of course, like some news reels and stuff before television was invented. Um, and uh, and animated uh, short films was uh, like a much bigger thing than animated feature films because uh, animation is expensive uh laborious and it uh there just aren't enough of them for the academy to like nominate enough for that to be an a category before you know 3d animation became widespread and then uh, you you get into the 2000s um so anima- animated short films uh you know a lot a lot of disney wins um it, it, you can like single handedly like that single category is the reason why Walt Disney to this day is the uh, person with the most Oscars to his name, simply because like he produced all of the Disney animated shorts that won. Yeah, I'm um, looking at the list right now, he won basically every year. Yes, and uh, and and even like today, um, it's like if if Pixar made one of those short films, that that's a pretty good like that's a pretty good likelihood that uh, that it, that's gonna win. Um, but uh, but but it's it's still, it's still pretty interesting to like have this uh, th- these like categories of things that would ha- get no recognition at all unless they get nominated. And then there are, like you know s- some like uh, art cinemas will have like evenings where they show uh, all the nominated like live action shorts or documentaries or uh, or, or animated shorts. And uh, and and it's it's uh, it's pretty interesting. And it's often very international. Like. Um, Compared to uh, some of the major categories, which are very Hollywood centric, um, though as, as as with a lot of things, like uh, th- there is a bias towards uh, you know uh, American stuff or at the very least English uh, language stuff. But with animation, that isn't as often a a thing because like often uh, when 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 you're doing a short animated film, like dialogue is pretty much optional. And that was definitely the case with uh, Father and Daughter, which is a, uh, a like a short, like nine minute long uh, piece, uh, dialogue free, very minimalist art about a uh, a girl who um, uh, who uh, like goes uh, goes bicycling by this lake where her father uh, rode out at some point when she was a kid, and it's just this montage of her like growing older and still looking out at it, and uh, and you know still missing him. Uh, that 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 sort of thing, and uh, and and it is like very very nicely made, nice uh, nice little waltz music that fits well with the uh, with the visuals, and uh, it did uh, catch the attention of someone uh, way way over abroad. Um, I think it's uh, namely uh, Isao Takahata who was the first to uh, yeah. really uh, pay attention to it, and uh, and in two thousand and four. He um, he uh, meets uh, and befriends uh, DeWitt at uh, the Hiroshima International Film Festival, and that becomes the start of this production journey. Um, then uh, 2006 is where is where it picks up. Uh, first of all, uh, so this is a part where like we we've been digging around, you know, in uh, in, in various like sources and and. Um, the closest thing we could come to like a, a clear timeline says that in 2006, uh, Ghibli uh, picked up one of his uh, shorts to distribute uh, at the uh, at the Ghibli Museum uh, to to show at the at the museum. However, it doesn't say specifically which one because it could have been that they wanted to show this um, this uh, award winning short which uh, Isao Takahata was a fan of. Or it might be uh, this abstract short film he uh, made in 2006 called *The Aroma of Tea*, but uh, but it's not clear, and uh, and Wikipedia sure isn't any help because that 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 thing like contradicts a lot of the um, the secondary sources we've uh, we've tracked down. 
Mm. Um, yeah, so, it says that Miyazaki was involved in finding the film originally back in like 2000, but that seems to, again, not be corroborated by anything. In fact, we're pretty sure Miyazaki had nothing to do with this movie at all. Yeah, like the, other, the other than maybe page. occasionally talking to DeWitt once or twice. DeWitt actually said in an interview that he hasn't talked to Miyazaki about it until after the movie was done, and then Miyazaki gave his feedback. But he also says, kind of tongue in cheek, he doesn't know if, if Miyazaki didn't influence the other people at Ghibli in you know their recommendations. So that's that's him. He doesn't know. <laughs> well, yeah, Miy- Miyazaki's so. influence is just probably overbearing. Like there's probably no way to escape it if you work at Ghibli. Huh? Yeah, I, I can imagine that, but uh, but like the the Wikipedia page is just just seems wrong because it tells a story where uh, where I think like Miyazaki uh, goes to Wild Bunch, uh, the, the the leader of the Wild Bunch, the production the European production studio um, that uh, that produced the film in co-production with Ghibli to ask them to find and uh, and work with uh, do it, but that does not track at all especially like with the timeline we know in which the um the work on the film began in uh, in 2006 when uh, when after, after like uh, hashing out this deal with uh, the ghibli museum they asked uh, him uh, hey uh, would you like to make a we would like to to make a feature film How, uh, what do you say uh, to which the uh, answered yes uh, i want to make something original and that became the start of a 10 uh, year process of um of iteration and reiteration and uh, animation uh until it uh, it got released in uh, 2016 uh it uh it screened at uh, the uh, uncertain regard uh in uh, at at a Cannes, Fist, Cannes film festival and um it uh yeah it uh, actually got nominated for uh, for best animated feature film at the uh, academy awards losing to uh Zootopia. Oh damn! Surely deserved. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I would have given that one to Moana, honestly, if I had had to, had to pick. Or, 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 or the red. I mean, the red turtle was like a, it was a long shot. Was but, that the but, competition yeah. at the time? Sorry, that was the competition at the time. Moana and Zootopia. Yeah, Moana, Zootopia, uh, Kubo, and the Two Strings. Which, uh, honestly, I might have given it to that one. That's the most impressive uh, stop motion animated oh, film ever made. Okay, cool. Um, and then um, uh, Mavila Couchette, or My Life as a Zucchini. Uh, this, uh, I believe, it's a French uh, or, or like Swiss uh, stop motion film about a an orphan kid. Good movie, but yeah, uh, that 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 was the that was the. So you just happened to have that, yeah. seen all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> okay, I beautiful. Didn't I tell you, everyone? He's an Academy Award nerd for some reason. That that's just how it is. <laughs> Yeah, that's that that that's going to be next up for the Norse cast. Uh, play, uh, plays and guides you through every single year oh, in Academy no. Awards history. <laughs> now that will turn into a very different podcast. I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, that's um, just just going to take what once a month. That's going to be like a hundred months. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, sure. The, it's going to take a while. Also, we need to be faster than the Academy Awards so we get catch up. So you know, I mean, we will be faster than the Academy Awards. Not at the pace we've been Not going at our so far. Not pace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we're, we're uh, trying to bring it back. All right. Yeah, well, uh, as as I was uh, explaining, it uh, went through like a lot of uh, like iteration and reiteration. Um, De- Dewitt uh, apparently like had some trouble like uh, turning his like uh, talents for for, for this um, like s- simple short uh, form storytelling uh, into like uh, something feature length because he had to like develop the characters more. Um, eventually, the studio uh, brought in uh, screenwriter uh, Pascal Ferran to uh, to help out with uh, with this um, with this problem, uh, and they uh, they worked on it. Like uh, apparently, there was like uh, a, a period of time where they kept like adding like more dialogue, more detail to like make everything clear. Uh, at which point, uh, uh, Suzuki uh, over from uh, from Japan uh, came with the. Uh, probably the most important studio notes uh, of the entire film which is you know what why like just just drop the dialogue this uh th- th- this guy what 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 uh, takahata like in like apparently like loved so much about his stuff was like how how these these emotions are so like uh, so clearly communicated with uh, with so little and uh, and so like 
a bit more minimalism, a uh, little less uh, wordiness, and uh, and suddenly you have a uh, uh, an uh, acclaimed animated film, which we uh, we now will have to uh, to discuss, and uh, and that makes it a, like a pretty unique thing for uh, for the the Norse cast because everything that happens in the movie happens like without uh, anyone like discussing ideas or telling each other anything like the only word of dialogue is uh hey when it's been they're yelling to to each other or something yeah there's a real intense dub versus sub uh, argument had about this movie i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i want to know if there's like a german or a swedish versions of the guy going hey or oh okay so no uh, down the cliff. i can tell you there's not uh because i have the german blu-ray of it and there's just no subtrack and i think the two audio tracks we have are just two different versions of surround sound <laughs> and it's not uh, different languages or you know whatever different dubbing which which i think is fascinating just like the idea of a movie that is so universal that it just does away with language entirely like just no, don't need it <laughs> okay I mean, it I, the thing is interesting that actually, even though Miyazaki was not involved, it weirdly is a bit to his ethos. Because as we've brought up many times before, Miyazaki will just um, storyboard out the entire film and then like add in dialogue after he's done the storyboards. Like he wants an idea of the film visually existing and being a concrete story before dialogue is like layered into it. So in in a way, I feel like this this kind of reaches that kind of idea of like a pure animation in which like just the moving images are telling you the story and without the sound. a further need for explanation. Oh yeah, the sound as well. Yeah. No, not to discredit the sound team, I like yeah. doing a lot of work. It is incredible actually. But I, I just want to go one step further. What I found interesting about how it is produced while we're on the topic of no language, there's also almost no close-ups of faces. Because uh, I think in one article I read that there's about as many close-ups of animals as there are close-ups of his face. And that means just like the balance is, you know, swayed away from the human, from the the facial expressions to express meaning. So it's all about body language ultimately. And that's yeah, also uh, cool I noticed element. that as well. And I think the origin of that comes from the French comic books, really. Because as we notice, uh, and many um, like people could have noticed as well, the guy looks a lot like a Tintin character, just has two dots for for eyes and a very low detailed face, yeah, which like is a bit. very common kind of way of drawing characters in French uh, comic books. Because yeah, there's like a long it's, it's history. It's almost of... literally the uh, the NPC face. You know, <laughs> the yeah, you're right. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> the, the pointy nose as well. Yeah. Um, but there's an interesting history it's like French animation and comic books because... Uh, not to not to super dive into it. The French have always been really big on comic books and animation for like ever since cinema existed, uh, and that that actually made them huge weebs as well. They were like one of the earliest people to start importing manga into Europe, uh, and even to this day, I think just behind North America, they're like the largest um, yeah. producer of manga. Uh, and even the French manga, you get a bunch of like manga like yeah. things made by like French Radiant. artists, like Radiant, like Radiant, yeah. So there's always been this connection, and I think that's why the the movie has a um a very comic book style feel. Like you said, very few close ups, and a lot of the shots barely move. I noticed that as well. Like there's very low camera movement. There's not any like move, move like points where like the animation is like a fluid kind of dramatic or action based scene. Everything yeah. feels like it's a series of like comic book panels that are just moving, like the characters moving in between them. And I yeah, think so that really adds to like, the isolation of it. Yeah, there's a strong sense of composition and like quietness to the movie that I feel this style brings along. And you could see it in the making of too, because there's one clip that's like 20 minutes of uh, DeWitt just sitting there and sketching out a scene and explaining how he does it. And it's like, uh, there's a sheet of paper, he starts sketching the background, he puts a sheet of paper on top, draws a character on it. And it, and he even says in one scene, like he puts some lines there, which is like comic language for a reaction, but it will not be in the movie. But for him, the, the process of making the storyboard was very much like uh, drawing comics. And incidentally, in an interview, he also talks about how his background actually is in comic drawing. So that he started out first with the idea of being like a comic illustrator and then only later started diving more into animation instead when he thought that was pretty cool. So lots of the DNA of comics is in here, uh, in a, and not like in the American comic way, but like the European comic uh, way that you describe as well, hipster. 
Uh, yeah, and not just his background, but the film's actual backgrounds, uh, interesting in the production, were all done by, like, charcoal um, sketches, you know, like the charcoal pencils and stuff. And yeah. that's why they have this very, like, earthy feel. Like, they don't look very lush, like, typical, like, Ghibli backgrounds, or even in a lot of other animations that I can think of from Europe. But they have this very, like... Um, Grainy. Yeah, this grainy texture. It's almost film-like as well. It's it, they they have this real uniqueness to them that makes them look like if you took any individual screenshot, you could just put that into a comic book. The the level of like detail in them. Yeah, there, yeah there's a then, lot of digital composition that's going on where compositing going on where like charcoal is made done for the colors and the outlines are added digitally to the background that gives it a very distinct and unique look. Yeah, yeah. There's there's like a lot of um, a lot of like. The uh, there's there's a texture to uh, to the movie to to the visuals that's like very, very like you you can almost like you know feel the the sand uh, you know uh, the, the 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 rust the the rustling grasses the uh, the, the bamboo stalks like and uh, and and part of it is that like very like uh, tactile um, uh, l- looking uh, you know background art but a lot of it is also uh, the like absolutely tremendously well done sound design. Um, oh my just God, the, yeah. the soundscape of this movie, uh, not, not, not just the, the score by, um, uh, by composer, uh, Laurent, Laurent Perez del Mar, uh, but also the, just, yeah, just, just, just all, all the sounds that like bring this, uh, deserted island, uh, and, 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 and the ocean and these, uh, these wordless characters yeah. to life. It's There's a, a cool clip really on YouTube tremendous. called tuning the birds the red turtle making of uh tuning the birds is an actual thing they did where they you know they had so much consideration for the sound effects that they said okay the birds screeching in this scene uh are kind of overlapping with the music and then they questioned okay should we pull down the volume of the birds should we pull down the volume of the music or do we harmonize them and the answer was we harmonize them so there was a lot of attention paid to how things like bamboo sounds and footsteps and rustling and waves and birds and other animal noises are harmonized with the music and form a sort of natural rhythm that you can really tell in most scenes when you like listen to it, pay attention to it. There's so much in this sound design that is really amazing. It makes it so that nature sounds are musical in this. And they said as well, the composer and the SFX guy talking about it, like, you as a viewer aren't really supposed to notice when the music goes away because the sound continues and then when the music comes back it is just like blending into the natural soundscape of the scene that's kind of how they imagine it except for like right. some exceptions where big massive music sets in for like dramatic scenes right absolutely there's there's a um uh there's there's a flow to it there there's a seamlessness to it that that is just as impressive as uh as, as the like uh, uh grander uh stuff and and the like uh the the, the main themes in, in in the score which which are like like these like this very like classical like uh m- melody with uh and, and and this like beautiful soprano that comes in every now and again but just as impressive is the uh, all the invisible ways in which they um they balanced all these uh all, all these bits of the soundscape uh in, in into a like into the movie it, it's a it it's done like in an unconventional way uh as, as well because for the most part like foley and uh and you know the score um foley being the uh the, the art of like uh, making sounds that uh that you then like mi- mix into the uh uh what happens on screen uh, but like the them being like made in a, in concert with each other is like uh, really unique and really explains a lot about how like uh, how absorbing and like and like crisp and right everything like uh, feels uh, sound wise. So you mentioned the soprano, and that's another element of the OST that I really want to touch on because in that same clip they also talked about how they consciously for many parts of the movie emitted choirs and human voices to emphasize the idea of loneliness on this island and that when a soprano voice is there it is either because the red turtle has already turned into a woman and like that's the other person basically symbolized as like there's now companionship or like in a very dramatic scene when the tsunami hits there's also a soprano in there and that was a decision by the composer himself who said okay Mr. DeWitt you wanted no music here I say we need music look at this I'm adding an effective dimension and this soprano is, 
you know, uh, an important piece in that particular movement of the OST. And I just think it's very interesting. Also, there's tons of wood vines, which are like meant to fit with the bamboo forest and stuff like that. So like the in instruments chosen in the OST also match the environments and the moods that are meant to be conveyed. The lack of voices in the music meant to convey the loneliness and so on. You know, it's just really impressive all around for, from the standpoint of audiovisual coordination here. Yeah, and then the way in which, uh, like you mentioned, like like silence is also like a, a, a an important instrument of the, of the soundscape, which uh, which often sounds weird, but like a big part of a composer's job is also to decide like where should we have no music at all and uh, and why, and uh, and and as such, the uh, the opening uh, minutes of, of the film after after we see uh, this uh, this man, our main character, like uh, sh uh, shipwrecked and. Uh, what washed ashore on this deserted island and trying to like look around for signs of life, trying trying to figure out how to build a raft. Uh, there's a lot of silence there, and that's like very very deliberate to like get us into that headspace of like isolation and uncertainty. And, um, and uh, but but as the movie like moves in, in, into like uh, new chapters where he, uh, he he gets this companion, this uh, th th this this lady seemingly transformed from from the red turtle and then later like forms a family and and gets like this whole life at the island the uh the music becomes a much bigger part of the of the soundscape and uh and like really uh, like just just good thoughtful filmmaking all around yeah i, I want to dive into like just exploring a little bit uh how the body language and sound effects and so on work together to tell the story by like having a scene analysis of a short scene which is when he first awakes on the beach and the very beginning of the film there's something that happens like he looks around he spots something in the distance and he rushes over and you just see him like spotted he rushes over he looks at it from another angle and you see that it's kind of like seaweeds and rocks and whatnot on the beach in a sort of human-like shape you, you sort of resonate in that moment think oh yeah there's something human-like to this. He thought he saw another person. Then you hear a sound, and it sounds vaguely human-like. You can see him like spring up, like his body language reacts to the sound that we also heard. He rushes over, and he sees it's like a like a seal. It wasn't a human at all. We see like an animal making these sounds, and this is the kind of uh, uh, dynamic of like body language and sound design that like makes the narrative's heart beat up in this movie, and that that's just very impressive from a I guess, filmmaking standpoint. That is something that I really cherished in this movie. Also, like, nature sounds like the rain approaching when you really hear the low rumbling bass and you know, oh, something's coming. And then the rain. And he reacts to the low rumbling sound of the rain coming. You know, it's it's kind of kind of incredible. Yeah, that, that, uh, that, I really that is like really the like... The string what, quartet as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I was wondering how that fed into the music and it's... The, the movie and its music because... I feel like there is kind of a symbolism there where it's like his lusting or like desire just to come back to civilization, to humanity, to a, to a, to, to escape this loneliness is portrayed via like a string quartet. Cause like we see the, the music in the rest of the movie is very like minimalist and naturalistic almost. It tries to blend in with the nature, but then we have something that's obviously like fabricated, obviously like, um, of human design of like four guys playing in like a in a in a proper harmony like a proper kind of um formalized style of music so i think that's meant to be like the the biggest contrast they could make with the with the analogy of the music yeah that's, yeah, a, that's, that's a pretty good point i think uh I, I, I think what what we're getting at here is like just ways of praising the movie for it's like for, for it's like vi visual and audio like uh, qualities which in my view, it's like that. That's that's the movie. That 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 is that is what makes this movie so special. Is that it is like almost purely uh, like a, an animated uh, like it, it's almost pure uh, animation. Uh, the, all, all the storytelling is done like uh, like visually through like uh, through the simple language of film and animation, and like all the artistry in in the backgrounds in the um, in, in, in the body language, in, uh, in 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 the in the music, in the way in the ways in which they all work in concert, it's it, like talking about this movie feels like it, it feels more like uh, like discussing a painting than a play, uh, so to speak. 
which yeah, uh, de definitely I mean, yeah. it makes it difficult to like go into like these like deep like th thematic textual analyses compared to something like as densely layered as a house moving castle or uh, tale of the princess Kaguya. Yeah. there will be some i promise but you know first i think we should continue with the gushing about visuals because here's the thing that i noticed too about the character animation at times i actually felt like oh this has to be cg but why does cg look so good but then it wasn't CG, and I just watched them making off, and they sh they had like actual recordings of people who acted out some of the movements and interactions between the characters, and just diligent animators sketching out all of the in between frames, and like all of this, except for the red turtle itself, uh, which is CG. All of the other stuff is entirely hand animated, not like directly, you know, sketched from the recordings, but like just looking at the recordings as reference. And that is really, really impressive because like I legitimately thought animation of the smooth would have to be CG in some way, but it's not. Yeah, it's that's that seamlessness. That yeah. seamlessness again. Yeah. And like so yeah, many it, frames. it almost oh, looks rotos rotoscope yeah. Yeah. Uh, at points, but I think that's because it's it's trying to like be this realistic style of human movement like we said with the um the music blending in with the nature they want the animation to kind of be lost in the the acting of the the characters themselves so there's almost no distinction there and in fact um a reason why this movie hit such a longer production than usual was because dewitt specified that like only a small team of key animators only about 10 to 12 worked on the movie as the full-time key animators uh, which is pretty small for even like a French production. Like you typically have a lot more. So even though the movie took much longer to make, it was because uh, he wanted this very consistent style of animation with like these, you know, exact uh, animators being like crafting their, their exact style onto the film. Yeah, in, in the in the making of stuff, he really talks, uh, and in interviews, he talks a lot about animators, how much he kind of respects them and cherishes them. And like he is like, I want the animators to sit in a room together not further than one meter apart so they can look at things together, talk about the same things, think about the same things and like work out this style to be really consistent. And he was kind of, it was hard to convince him at first to say, listen, we're not going to get this done unless we get assistant, uh, assistant animators. And then he explains that they got a Hungarian studio though, to do the assistant animation. But then he also says, hey, I wouldn't call them assistant animators. I would call them animators of the second face uh, because he just thinks the assistant animators did such an amazing job drawing all the in-between frames and adding to all of these uh, key frames and so on. Like, It just seems like they had the most excellent animation stuff that Europe could muster on this. And it shows because it definitely is impressive as hell animation all around. Yeah, I think it's definitely a testament to do it as a director that you could have a lot of production companies working on this. Like if you look in the credits, like they list multiple different people from like different parts of the continent. And of course, Ghibli helping with notes as well. But still the film maintains like a really consistent style. Like it doesn't feel like it's loose parts being jammed together. But even like the CG on the Red Turtle itself kind of has a quality that blends in with the rest of the film like pretty well. They definitely worked hard on the CG. Uh... But I think it kind of still sticks out. DeWitt kind of explains why they chose to do that because it's kind of hard to make the pattern of the turtle's shell work in 2D animation, and I get that. It still kind of stuck out to me, and I would call it like the one sort of blemish on the otherwise visually like flawless movie. But it's not major. I usually am much more opposed to CG being used in this. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I think part of it, part of the reason it works, is that the red turtle is like uh, in the story also like this strange uh, otherworldly thing. Uh, so, so having it like set apart from the rest of the movie, like uh, animation technique wise, makes sense. And also, uh, l l like we discussed, like the even the two D animation feels like rotoscope, feels like three dimensional, uh, uh, often enough that that it blends together pretty well. Um, and like what, what, one interesting thing is, and this like gets back to something you mentioned earlier, hipster, with like the way that it it, it clearly has this like European, this like a French comic book feel. The the characters don't like uh, don't get deformed in any like in any meaningful way. There's there's no squash squash and stretch principle used. There's no like uh, you know uh, blur frames or like action lines. It's uh, and th there's a like real weight to them as well. Like when when you see see the man like exploring the island, and he he uh, he, he walks along these 
these like smooth cliffs and 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 there's this gap he has to jump over it it really like just looks right like 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 he he really is like putting his weight down and like getting ready and making the jump and getting a sure footing it's like and, and again it's, it's the sort of thing you don't really know to be impressed by unless you like ha- have a like understanding of like how difficult this sort of thing uh, can be so i feel like we've gushed about the visuals maybe we give a little bit of a plot synopsis as far as we can talk about anything like a plot in this movie i mean there's obviously a plot but like no dialogue whatsoever um and then go into talking about some of the you know maybe scenes that stood out to us and maybe some parts of the symbolism that we want to discuss questions like present some readings if we have any um because i feel like um the synopsis would be a good idea to you know ground uh everyone listening in in this and uh yeah right so uh as mentioned we we start with a with a man uh seemingly shipwrecked we don't see the ship he originated from we do see an overturned lifeboat he uh like it's a stormy night he uh he washes up ashore on the on this deserted island um and like the the first like chapter i would call it of the movie uh is like uh is more, more akin to to a a, a a robinson aid you know uh, robinson crusoe you know cast away this uh story of a, someone stranded on an, on, a, on a deserted island trying to like use their you know uh, whatever resources available and their wits to uh, survive and uh, and get get home or get help and he uh, he makes uh, he makes a raft out, out of these bamboo and he goes out there and something bumps into the bottom of the raft uh, a couple of times and then like breaks it and he can't find out what the hell that was was that a shark he returns he, uh, he he's annoyed he makes another one Second time for the charm, right? Except he goes out, same thing happens again. Uh, it gets broken up, and he uh, he he returns to shore, just like absolutely depressed uh, and, and like lacking almost any like energy or motivation to do anything. Um, he eventually like does go out a third time, and this time he spots the uh, the perpetrator, this this giant red turtle which uh, breaks apart his raft, but does not seem interested in hurting him at all. Uh, he, returns to sh- he returns to shore where he is once again, like absolutely frustrated and enraged. And uh, the, the turtle uh, comes up on land, like, uh, you know, waddles itself up on the beach. And, uh, and in, uh, in his rage, he, he hits it with a stick and like turns it over to, uh, to you know, die from dehydration in the, in the, in the sun. Um, eventually he, however, he has like a, a clear, like sense of regret. He, uh, he, he tries to revive it, uh, you know, a futile attempt. Uh, uh, however, eventually he wakes up and in the turtle shell is not the carcass of this, uh, dead animal, but a beautiful red haired woman, um, whom he, uh, he takes care of for, uh, uh, for a bit while, uh, while she, uh, sleeps uh, until she wakes up and uh, uh, you know puts the shell out to uh, like uh, to see, and he decides to put the remains of um, of his new raft he's working on. He puts that up to see as well, and the two begin a life together uh, instead on that island. They uh, they have a kid who uh, who grows up, uh, you know, be, uh, be becomes a becomes a young adult. There's a, a tsunami that uh, that strikes the island, uh, almost uh, almost manages to wipe them out. Uh, however, the uh, they they all they all fine. The, the dad is saved by the son, who has this seemingly supernatural connection with the ocean and, and with the turtles out there. He seems to be able to like swim for miles without exhaustion, and so he swims out to uh, to save his dad, who got pulled out by uh, by the backdraft of the tsunami. Uh, eventually the same a son becomes an adult and you know the outside world is calling him he has to go and uh, and the parents seem to understand they uh they part uh and the uh, uh the man and the woman they uh they grow old together until eventually uh the uh the man uh dies peacefully in his sleep uh, sleeping next to his uh his longtime companion 
and she uh, returns to see in her original form as a, as a red turtle. And that's the movie. That is the movie. Thank you very much. Yeah, so as you could probably all hear, it is a little bit of a... Well, I, I have re heard the description magical realism. I have heard the description surrealism. I personally lean to more, more towards the idea that it's surrealist because... Um, I don't know if the term magical realism could apply here, but th that's besides no, I, the point. I disagree. It's 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 more like a fable, uh, which is what it's often called in like reviews, like uh, yeah, describing as a modern fable uh, and and uh, or maybe like an allegory or something. But, but yeah, what, I feel like something that really informed my reading about the the movie going forward, uh, thinking about the whole thing. And you're right, I think it ties into this thing where it's like, is it a fable? Is it like a fairy tale? Is it magical realist? Um, I think it's. It, I would agree with Platon. It's a bit more like fable-ish. Like it's a bit less based in reality or a concrete world. Even though the animation kind of sells you on that, which we could argue of whether that's a conflict or not. But just there's one quote from Dewitt specifically that says, "I didn't want to tell a story of how he survives, but rather the extreme solitude," which to me I feel like informs everything about the movie, particularly because Platon, you said about it being a crusoe like story at the beginning but honestly I, looking over my notes uh seven minutes into the movie he finds like what will be apparently his consistent food source for like the rest of his life uh and like he has no struggles with surviving there are no predators on the island he never needs shelter because it's apparently nice and tropical he's never worried about dying of exposure so like there is actually no survival elements in the story whatsoever the only yeah. thing that is like like that is that he keeps trying to build rafts to leave and that's purely based on the isolation he feels like even the the one time he's in danger is because he falls down into like a a deep rock fissure where there's no one to come get him because someone could easily just throw him a rope and he could climb back up but he's alone so therefore like that's what is the danger that he is like alone and helpless without civilization without other people so uh are you then kind of suggesting that from this basically fundamental loneliness, um, I, 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 it feels a bit silly to ask this, but that he kind of like imagines his life with a red turtle after he kind of recognizes his resonance with nature? Or like, what do you uh, think is happening? There? I, I guess that's the way you could read the movie, but I think that's a pretty like shallow and pointless reading that it's all in his head. You know, you can say that for a lot of movies. Uh, no, I, I mean, the movie itself is about loneliness because to me, the key metaphor is that like, why does the red turtle want not want him to leave the island? Why does he does it keep thwarting his efforts to build her off and escape back to the world he knows? It's because I feel like fundamentally the movie is about the turtle itself is also lonely, like it wants him as as much as he wants to leave, and he stays once he realizes it's a woman kind of like him, like he he decides to not go back to civilization and instead, um, like have a life here. Okay, I think that's interesting. Um, so what do you think then, uh, I guess we'll do it Socratic dialogue, so, right? Like, what do you think then the red turtle itself kind of symbolizes? Like, to me, the most obvious one that would pop up in my mind is nature. But then it is pretty difficult for me to figure out, like, is, is are you saying then that, for example, nature wanted his companionship? Or how do you see it? Um, I think it's something kind of like that. Again, it's it's hard to pin it down. I wouldn't exactly describe the the turtle or the woman as nature itself because I feel like the movie plays a lot with like the idea of nature. But I think it's kind of just more trying to key into this like fundamental like need for companionship. I guess you could say. I mean, I think there's a very nihilistic way to take this movie, in which uh, it's fundamentally about just people wanting. Uh, someone to stop them from being lonely and that's it because it's like the red turtle doesn't know anything about him it just wants him to stay and it relentlessly like essentially punishes him for trying to leave until he gives up and they stay on the island and the same for him and you could say that that's like uh just they're purely looking for someone instead of like you know a, a real connection or something beyond that but then again i think you could also say there's a way to see the movie as like what else does he need in the outside world like, what, why is he going back to civilization if not to, like, not be alone anymore? But then the moment he realizes he isn't alone, he's content with himself. He's, like, okay with the life on the island. 
I, I guess that's where we get into the kind of aspects about this movie that didn't leave me very happy. Uh, in the group chat before this, I, I did write a little bit about my, let's say, discontent or unhappy feelings about what the uh, meaning of the movie uh, read as to me, uh, how I interpreted the metaphors, because I found the, I found it pretty, let's say, let me actually start a little bit further back, right? Like Because I think this intense minimalism that is present in it being a castaway narrative without actually talking about being castaway and it being like a centered and focused narrative with this perfect paradise island which except for the tsunami is perfectly capable of keeping humans healthy and happy and nourished and so on and so on where um, we decide to zone in on something really core to human nature or as one of the promotional um you know, lines to summarize the movie is the milestones in the life of a human being, right? If that is what we are doing by zooming in on this like very minimalist presentation, then I find the idea that, you know, you can be happy and content with life just because a woman popped up a bit questionable, honestly. I I, I can't really find it in me to say that I on the one hand, really appreciate this old stereotype of the feminine being associated with like nature, nourishment, giving, companionship, and, you know, mystique. But I also can't appreciate the fantasy that paradise is a perfect nuclear family where you are not bothered by society at large, but can, you know, have your libertarian, self-sufficient lifestyle in, in a way. You know what I mean? Uh, th this, uh, these are the things that make me feel kind of odd about what the movie seems to be saying. Yeah, I, th I, th I think um, I think what so part of what's happening here is like, uh, of course, that reading does probably like track with what happens in the movie. Um, for me, it's it's hard to agree because it doesn't. I, I didn't feel those feelings watching it, and uh, and I, I think we what what I'm getting at is uh, like we said, this is a different type of beast from uh, from a lot of Ghibli movies. It's this not. It, it it has it is minimalist it's working with like something like some base primordial like archetype stuff yeah some adam and eve to, shit. yeah exactly to to, to yeah, some literally adam and eve, adam and eve stuff, stuff. Um, yeah some some mermaid folklore you know um these some you know like how how many like uh folk tales involve like uh uh, wild animals tra transforming into uh be beautiful people and transforming back um, and like the, I know the, 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 the question is like, to what degree does like working with the, these sorts of archetype, to what degree does that like, uh, accidentally, uh, like tap into some pretty like problematic assumptions at, at the, at the core of many cultures and especially at the core of like very old stories. And to what degree is it like, just like a, a way to, get at something universal through uh through shorthand which like uh, does like evoke you know this like old fa like fable-esque uh story and then these like strong and simple emotions uh yeah so speaking specifically about the adam and eve thing i noticed as well like very actually specifically not only are they kind of like in an eden itself like this completely sufficient like land that gives them everything they need to survive but also specifically the scene where she is naked because she she wakes up from being like a turtle and she gets rid of the shell but then she's naked underneath it and she specifically like is embarrassed about it and he has to offer his shirt to her so like literally like in uh genesis 3 7 then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were both naked so when adam and eve you know eat the, the fruit of knowledge they both were aware they're naked and it's this kind of like realization of um like how they should be it's like an awakening to their kind of like fundamental knowledge of themselves so like now that she is like a full person and not just a turtle anymore uh she's even afraid to, to be naked which i think is yeah really brings in a biblical image to this uh to this movie uh, that's uh, actually something interesting there is uh like at the end of the movie after the uh, after their son has uh, has you know say love into the, into the horizon and they grow all together they we, we see them just like being naked out uh, uh out in the ocean like unbothered by it uh which like 
it, it it's not like they're like completely naked all the time from that point but 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 it is like a scene that seems like particularly significant uh, when when you add in that layer that you mentioned hipster yeah i noticed that as well but i'm not still sure what to make of it i think it, it was kind of more as like the closer they were with each other like especially yeah. towards uh his death there's kind of like less of a i, I think it was almost like there's less of a boundary between them because you know essentially she's a she's ashamed to be naked when they first meet as they're essentially strangers but like now towards the end that spent so much life a lot of their lives together that like i guess you could almost say like there's 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 nothing they could hide from each other yeah it, it might be simple that way and uh and, and perhaps like even the the scene of her embarrassment is simple that way as well it's just like a thing that happens and no biblical allegory was intended but like who knows and they, but it's there anyway especially when i refuse you have to skull. not read biblical allegory into it <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely think that you cannot write such a, let's say, deep archetypal story about a man and a woman trapped on an island in perfect homeostasis, uh, other than have it be a, a reference to the Bible in some extent. Even if just like, just from the standpoint of, you know, Western society and the Christian influence that it has omnipresent everywhere there. But, you know, what does interest me too in this, you mentioned clothing and being naked. So one thing that I picked up on is the question of, what kind of relationship to nature does this movie talk about? And one thing that I did notice is that in the design documents on the making of, the uh, wit shows a, a picture of a design for a hut that he builds out of the bamboo. But then he comments and says, uh, this was initially planned, but it wasn't needed. And this is very noteworthy to me because he seems to live 50, 60, 70, whatever, how, how many years on this island, and he never needs to build anything. And as humans, we kind of, the main thing we associate with humans is like the making of civilization, the building of tools and weapons and buildings, houses, uh, you know, rafts, you know, except for rafts, which are destroyed. And he consciously gives up the idea of a raft. You know, that was the scene. She sends her turtle shell into the ocean saying, I forgive you. And he sends the raft and says, I'll stay with you. That is how they start approaching each other, right? So consciously, this movie says that the human gives up this essentially human component, the culture making of humans, the, the, the building making of humans. And it was considered in the design phase to have him build a hut, but he didn't. He never did build it. And I think that's very significant because the only remaining element of human culture, of human civilization building, is clothing. Because we see them, you know, process the hide of the dead seals that they find on the on the shore, and they even do it together. And that is the only way in which a human involvement really happens in this ecology. Um, even when he built the boat, they made, at the raft, he, they made sure to show that he only picks up the bamboo shoots that have already fallen over instead of showing him cutting them down. You know, what I think is interesting is here the question: What kind of view of nature does this communicate? What is the relationship between the human and nature? Because I still kind of see the red turtle as embodiment of nature and this sort of relationship to nature as a statement of the movie. And what I think is we should draw a contrast to Takahata here. Because as we remember in our Only Yesterday cast, we talked a lot about how Takahata highlights ecological farming and you know how a supposedly natural landscape is actually all human-made, that nature itself is already cultivated and structured by humans in such a way that people who wouldn't know would see nature and say, oh, nature's beauty. And you know the farmer goes, no, I did that. Come on. And the interesting thing about the view of nature that this movie presents is that human involvement should basically be zero. He should just, you know, imagine a scenario where the island isn't plentiful, where the tsunami actually does kill him. I think that's just what the view of nature is in this movie. Like, a really no human element whatsoever. Um, I, I slightly disagree. I feel like this movie's concept of nature is, is is a bit different because typically when we talk about these like nature versus man narratives, well, not maybe not versus, but at least like conflicting or opposed in some way, we we imagine it of like man in his artificial place, in his artificial towns or cities, and then nature is like as it existed always. And though even though Takahata, of course, called into question that kind of narrative, particularly in Only Yesterday. I still think this movie presents a different thing. And to me, 
all the symbolisms symbolism suggested less like man nature and more like the ocean and land as being this kind of like yin and yang this kind of feminine and masculine thing because again it's like he lives a very ascetic life he has like no buildings nothing but that's because the the island essentially is his home he doesn't need to build anything it is already perfectly there for him almost like it was made for him there's no worry about predators or food like i said uh and even the uh, uh, this is just like a silly thing i noticed they do it like in one of the like a like a fade cut where like the island itself is like shaped like him lying down like they go right, from yeah, a cut yeah. Very from him cut. on the beach to like the a shot of the island itself which to me is like part of like the way that it's like the island is him essentially uh, and the ocean is represented by the turtle, and it's kind of about a communion between the two of them, um, in that sense. Though I don't exactly know where to go with it in terms of like man's belonging with nature, because I essentially think this movie still kind of posits that man is fundamentally part of nature. Yeah, uh, one thing I also wanted to point out um, when you talked about the whole like uh, uh, human uh, uh, like. Uh, like human, what, what do you call it? Like administrated, uh, cul- uh, you know, um, cultivated nature. Um, I mean, th- th- there is some of that going on, uh, especially when the tsunami hits. Yeah. There's a there, there's this very specific scene where the, the family they they gather up all the uh, all, all the dead bamboo, uh, for, like and burn it in a huge bonfire. And and as they do that, we see the new sprouts uh, popping up uh, around the soil. Um, which I mean that that is uh, an element of this like uh, cultivation, this management of uh, of of the the island, um, which I I think is significant. Uh, uh, I don't think it's just because the fire looked like absolutely super cool, which it does. A very cool bonfire. There's definitely something to that because I wasn't really able to place the bonfire scene anywhere uh, aside from like the very utilitarian description of, well, they cleaned up the island and they burned what, you know, was dead uh, bamboo. It's, it's, it's the only time that they light a fire yeah. in the entire movie. Which On, is in a fucking castaway movie. Come on. Like, yeah. That's weird. Um I mean, I guess the point where I was going uh, with the question of what kind of image of nature this has was that in different articles and different um, papers, I read like a discussion of, okay, is this human-centric or is this nature-centric? Is this anti-anthropocentric or is this anthropocentric? We, we had the term anthropocentrism before in a couple of podcasts, just quickly, like it's the notion that the humans are at the center of the world. And the question is, are humans at the center of the world or are they not? And the interesting thing is that I found competing opinions about this movie. Some say, well, the fact that he never aspires to do the human thing, which is basically to colonize and make use of the land and start building and roads and infrastructure and, you know, chopping down bamboo shoots, that suggests an anti-anthropocentrism, the idea that humans aren't at the center of the movie. But in the second reading, the one that I try to get into is... I also find the movie isn't very interested in nature as much as it is interested in how this barren or simplistic or let's call it minimalistic paradise serves as a backdrop for the story about, you know, essential human nature in a way. And in big quotation, in big air quotes, but like human nature, the milestones of human life, human development, birth, um, love, sex, death, all of these things themes seem to be the main explored ideas on this island. So I find in this weird contradiction that some read it as completely anti-anthropocentric and the other perspective that I think it doesn't really engage much with the question of how humans and nature live together by presenting this simplistic paradise which just nourishes them without him having to do anything. Um, This is what really confuses me. Uh, Because this and the tsunami, and I guess those are the things I want to get into, right? Because the tsunami too is the only time in the movie, aside from the turtle, you know, destroying the boat, where nature has a catastrophic element to it. And we know nature is like that. There are rainfalls that destroy what we have built, that ruin our crops. There is, you know, winds that topple over trees. There's earthquakes and volcanoes and, you know, tsunamis. And that is nature at its essence. It's not a perfect nourish, uh, nourishing, you know, paradise but it's also not like uh, a pure evil or catastrophe or you know just hell-bent on breaking human existence 
But I find the movie doesn't go deep into the question of how humans and nature actually coexist in favor of the simplistic fable of love and, you know, cycles of life and death. Uh, I, I would agree. I think your description where it's like it's using nature and this imagery to tell more of a story about like, you're right, uh, human lives, the cycle of life, uh, all those kind of like, it's like amp- an- anthropomorphizing uh, nature in that sense. Literally. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's like you said, uh, like like we're talking about the um, the masculine and feminine, the Adam and Eve. I felt like, uh, as I was saying, that's the, to me the relationship between like land and the ocean. Is these kind of two things that are like opposite but connected and entwined and it's kind of trying to get that fundamental thing because i feel like uh, the important thing to me as well to note was that um the the ocean itself is kind of represented by the red turtle but specifically turtles themselves are like land and ocean creatures like turtles can live in the ocean they do go on land. They, I think they have to go on land. Most they, species. they are born on land. And, and yeah, they're born on land, and most of them have to go on land, depending on the species. But, you know, it's like they're essentially creatures that live in the in between these two worlds, these two states. And But, like, so is man to an extent. Like, we see he's a seafarer, clearly. He got washed up here, uh, and he's constantly, like, making boats to go out to sea. Like, he's not afraid of the ocean. He's not trying to stay on land at the beginning. So I think it's kind of trying to show that this there's this idea of loneliness and this the idea of these two species trying to like connect through their separation from these kind of two different elements these two primordial forces that represent like a masculine and feminine pole see that that i, I think is part of my criticism because i think essentializing the feminine onto ocean and nature and so on has like a very long history of like fertility goddesses and like you know the ocean the the waters that flow from in between the legs uh, i'm not making this up this is real part of like mythology and shit yeah i, I don't um, disagree yeah, but, that it yeah. kind of has those elements to it yeah well like m- maybe it's a feature and not a bug like m- maybe it's meant to evoke these like the, these uh, ancient ideas like even even as like you can absolutely pro- problematize them today but just the fact that you recognize them might actually be like part of the point i um, I, I agree i think that is part of the point i think that is very much dis- part of the you point. don't like the point <laughs> but here's here's the thing i i'm not really i'm not even it's not necessary to put in my own words i can just cite the one review that i found where a, a woman was writing about this movie who basically said as much as um the film seems to say women are mythical creatures, animals that are able to briefly become human. I'm sorry to say that in 2016, such views slash metaphors don't do any good to us. Women trying to achieve equal place in society. Women are human 24 hours every day of our lives. And just like men, we feel pain, we can die and be killed. Idolizing womanhood is just as belittling as judging women on their looks. Um, I don't 100% agree with everything the quote says, but I think it gets to a core point that is to be made here. The woman in this film exists as a companion to the man. And she is like this mysterious natural being that is kind of like this elusive, mysterious, you know, natural force that is there. And I I recognize completely why this supposed ancient universalism makes women who watch this movie feel a little bit left out. You know what I mean? Well, um, it, it gets, gets back to, like, whether, like, I mean, I guess minimalism is inherently essentializing because if if you have this, like, story that's supposed to be, like, just so, like, stripped down to its core and uh, and, and fable-like, uh, the, where the, the characters end up representing not just this man, but man, or, and not just this magical b- woman, but m- women as being magical, and not just like this son, but like, uh, but like uh, children, adolescents, and like father, fatherhood, motherhood, like th- these big ideas be become like part of it because there there isn't anything else. Then yeah, I I, I can see why you would uh, you would end up in a situation where it becomes essentializing, um, and I can see that, but I just I I just don't feel it, and I don't feel that it's like. It, it it's not what the movie like is what the movie is to me is like the these these are amazing colors this like uh, amazingly like controlled animation this beautiful soundscape this experience more than it is a story trying to tell you something uh, in specific uh, and of course it can't avoid saying something 
and perhaps like what it what it says uh, in, in in the way that uh, that you end up reading it is you know problematic in some aspects but but it's just not as big of a deal i think when when a movie is like this this aesthetically uh, focused and this aesthetically beautiful i mean um the reason i bring it up is just because you know uh, it's not that i had this thought about what kind of stereotypes it evokes and then decided i didn't like it i kind of felt something was off and i needed to think about what it is and as i researched more and thought more i felt my sort of understanding of why i felt a bit weird about what it presents uh, to grow and i want to lead that to the next question but first i think hipster wants to say something uh yeah i was just gonna say i feel like i'm kind of in between the space between you two and your feelings on it where I agree you know, intellectually with like a lot of the points you're making, specifically the way it treats women and shows um, this feminine ideal, which is very like baked in like millennia old stereotypes. But I agree with Platon that like the, the movie's filmmaking is, you know, like part of the narrative and part of the layering of the themes itself. And I feel like the movie does a really strong job in like emphasizing the emotions of the, the woman turtle lady and her, um, empathizing with her because like i said to me fundamentally the movie is about kind of this loneliness it's kind of fundamental like needing for others and needing that kind of comfort and i feel like the whole narrative with the turtle it, it doesn't want him to leave like it specifically stops him from leaving uh even though it's still kind of this weird you know magical turtle creature that is yet to turn into a woman it still just wants him around And then when she turns into a turtle, I kind of read that as almost like taking the form that can best connect with him because it's not like enough that like she just stays around the island, you know, stopping him from leaving again and again and again. It's like she's almost like transcends to this new form that can allow some kind of connection, can allow something to actually happen between them because they're just both so isolated from like everything else in the world. There's no other, again, I think another point, to bring up is we see no other red turtles. We see that the sun connects with like the other turtles that like maybe swim around the bay, but no giant red turtles. So like we're, we're at least to our knowledge, she's the only one of her kind. And to me, that is kind of like empathetic with just kind of a fundamental human need to to find something with others. And you could say it's very like heteronormative, and which I would agree. But like uh, like Platon says, also it's just trying to be as simple as possible so maybe it falls into those pitfalls while still uh presenting like a holistic human message okay i mean i i kind of see of course the point right like the question is okay how do you depict universalism about human life and by kind of by necessity it is that we reproduce through heterosexual reproduction so if you want to have a family have children you know love all that in the most universal terms you sort of necessarily have to do it like this right i still uh think it is couched a lot in sort of the signifiers of like old stereotypes about the feminine and also like leading into my next big question about the movie i get to the next layer of why i find in this particular case it stands out to me which is let's let me just introduce it by a bit of a leading question and it will sound very confusing if you've seen the movie and you have so uh just warning what does this movie say about society okay not in the sense we live in a society but what relationship exists between these characters and an imagined human society somewhere well essentially none like there's there's a very like important scene uh when uh soon after we first like meet the uh the the son character who's uh, who's still like a little kid he finds a like little glass bottle uh on, on on the beach goes goes to like show it to the parents and uh, and and the father goes to uh to make a little little comic illustri- book illustration basically what's happening here is he's telling the the son that there is an outside world that they are not everything there is that that outside the island there are all kinds of people and animals uh and that's where that uh bottle came from um and Later on, we see uh, when the son makes that decision that he needs to like leave the island. He uh, he like looks at the horizon uh, through the uh, through yeah. the bottle, um, and like which is like j- j- just a great little bit of visual storytelling there to like 
explained that there's there's this curiosity in him that he wants to go out there and uh, and see things. So like that, I, I think part of it is just this universal, uh, well, almost universal, but like pretty uh, like uh, important like part of like many people's lives of this, you know, uh, familial comfort, this uh, th- this place of uh of safety and a, a place you you know very well uh and at some point you you have to go elsewhere and uh and see other things and you have to like uh you know move out so so to speak and like that's that i think is like the relationship to society is that it's it's this outside thing that the uh that the man like decides to uh to not um you know to uh, to not pursue uh and which like uh, him be- he becomes comfortable in this like uh, in this environment and which his son eventually like chooses to pursue instead um I mean, I, I think like that's just like one of the things one of the like really like beautiful and like sad scenes is just this simple these parents acknowledging that their son has like grown into a, a, a full like grown into an adult uh like and and has his own things he must do and saying goodbye it's just it's just a, such a deeply human and like real thing that it, this movie just full of these little moments of that and I, I think that that's what makes the movie beautiful uh to me personally um i think this ties back into still what i was saying about the the concept of loneliness or maybe not loneliness would be the right word but again it's this like you're saying, playing this kind of fundamental human emotion, like this need for like others or this need to at least know what your position with others. Because it's like we, we see, yeah, the father chooses to stay. The father came from society and he chose to stay on the island because he found everything he wanted was here. Everything he needed at the very least was on this island. But then the son grew up. And it's 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 implied because the son is I don't know turtle born or whatever the term would be that he's like this this being that's caught in between this this oceans like life where he connects mystically with the turtles he's a deep connection to them but then also his father like draws for him images of the world and he wonders about the glass bottle about you know a civilization that could create such an artificial thing and uh, he ass- ass- and he leaves and we know he never comes back. So the, the the father dies of old age before he returns. So whether the son decided to stay in society or maybe become a turtle, possibly, it's at least the idea that like the son had to know, like the son had this longing that couldn't be fulfilled, like staying where he is on the island. He needed to find other people. He needed to find other turtles, maybe, and like connect in some way to one of these worlds that his parents kind of always had him in the middle of. Yeah. Uh, I I agree with that, uh, and that's why I think the son presents a very interesting dimension. Because I get the sense that he leaves to return to society, and both you, Platon, and Hipster, you have identified that as well. Um, what I find interesting, though, is you know comparing a little bit how does Studio Ghibli depict society in comparison to this? Because we already compared nature, so I want to now compare society because I find it insightful, right? Oh, you mean it's less communal, there's less, less, less of a... Yeah, society doesn't really show up in this movie, and the answer to loneliness is not find community, but the answer is find wife, you know what I mean? So I'm coming, <laughs> so I'm coming back to my essential point. The son, of course, has to leave, and I think that is interesting because it seems to be more something in line of what I would imagine, right? Like the idea is humans cannot live apart from society. You might remember this phrase because we used it in Grave of the Fireflies, um, which, you know, Takahata directed. So I find that especially Takahata shows the witch here very interesting. Um, I mean, the witch's uh, uh, Academy Award winning shot, of course, has society be very present. Tons of people show up in it, you know. But this movie, I think it's interesting when it does away with uh, society like that and allows the man's decision to not live with society to be a correct one. You know what I mean? Because, of course, movies are crafted to make these kinds of decisions be correct or false in hindsight. So he seems to have lived a satisfying life. But I still don't like the answer that what staves of loneliness is find wife, have child, rather than find community, find society, find your place with other humans. 
And instead, what I think it does is, you know, find wife, have child on this lonely, perfect paradise and homeostasis means you can find happiness completely separate from society because the things that make people truly happy are these very simple things about find wife, get child. You know what I mean? So I guess this is, again, why I tie this into all of the aspects that I personally found a bit problematic about what the metaphors symbolize because I find they tie together so nicely to give us an all-encompassing picture of how, yes, maybe the son has to leave for society, but the man's decision to not be with other humans is essentially correct. And I feel very weird about that because I think community and society is actually what the human experience is about. Well... Sadly, it's not what this movie is about. I guess I, I don't know. Like it, it I, I guess there's a different version of this movie where either we like see like why exactly like what his previous relationship to society was before he became a castaway, um, or like we uh, see some sort of like society forming on the island, uh, and I can absolutely like uh, see that. Like my my best like understanding of like this uh quote-unquote idyllic uh relationship between mankind and nature uh it's it's not this like you know paradise island with a single family it is more of like a a community of people living in uh, in concert with the natural rhythms of uh, of the nature around them uh managing it to some extent but uh, but like respecting it like that's definitely you know you know the whole like you know Uh, indigenous tribes being like uh, uh, wiped away from like the rainforest in order to fell it that 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 sort of thing comes to mind but i don't honestly think that this movie is interested in those questions that like those questions of that like um that that sort of relationship i i i honestly think it's it's mostly interested in this sensation of loneliness and the sen- sensation of forming a, f- a family, the sensation of like growing old together, of seeing your uh, like uh, your your son leave for to do other things and saying goodbye, uh, like a, a, those sensations, as well as you know the sensation of like swimming in clear water or like a ru- ru- rustling grass. Uh, it's it, it's a very you know. It's a very feelings. It's very, uh, it's very sensory, and it's very just all in all. Like the, the movie feels to me like an adaptation of a very old fable, except like the uh, it's it it's an original story, and uh, I don't know. I, I think there's merit to that, even if we can like criticize how like hey, if you're making up a new fable, like maybe maybe don't go back to like the like old well of uh, you know female mystique and stuff. Uh, I guess I get that. Uh, yeah, there's a little quote from DeWitt about it's like um, he said like the starting point was his was his feeling was this like strong sense of a, of emotion for nature and love and this kind of vague human thing and and he specifically said wouldn't it be great to make a film where that is put forward certainly not as a message but just to celebrate that and see if it works so I think Clayton that very much is in line with your reading of the movie where it's like. Sure, the the movie is of course baked within like a lot of cultural perceptions, and those are kind of inescapable. Particularly someone, you know, from like our current times and like with our history. But it also is meant to just trying to be a bit more like effortless and like yeah, like this this kind of emotional vagary to it, which I think the movie again does accomplish. Like we say, the animation and the the, the filmmaking like really sells this uh, simplistic kind of story. Uh, and fundamentally it comes back to what I think I said at the beginning where it's like, there's kind of just a, a nihilistic and cynical way to take the movie. And then there's more of a, uh, an optimistic way to take it where it's like, why does he stay on the island? Does he stay because the island has everything he needs or does he stay on the island because it will do, because it will like give him, you know, a wife and make him from stop being lonely. And that's just enough. Uh, and depending on how you view the question from your own personal perspective, I feel like the movie is open to. Yeah, it it might be my perspective, which brings a lot of negativity in this, because my sense, let, let's just talk about my sense of what would be, you know, nicer on this island, right? I would build a hut, 
you know, I would try to make accommodations. The notion of resigning yourself to, you know, sleeping on the beach every day or in the grass, you know, I don't know. Like, it feels like the movie isn't interested in the capacity for humans to engage in meaning making of any variety, be it society or civilization or culture, beyond the simple, you know, dimension of love here. And now it is, of course, our resident big Valheim fan that's always trying to get us into it. Yes. Uh, that's why he would constantly be building a hut, upgrading his home. Exactly. That's I want to make it more anthropocentric, right? Like, I yeah. want to build the roads. I want to build a fort, you know, tree houses, whatever. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm just trying to, you know, just impress the point that if we are having such a minimalist work that really, for the wit, as he himself says, tries to get to like something core about the human experience and about nature. I find uh, myself not really resonating with his vision of what that is. And I find myself also very unable to take his vision at face value. I, I guess that is where I end up uh, uh, with the movie in terms of my, you know, general opinion on it. I find the craftsmanship incredible, as we've already established by gushing about it endlessly. But um, the imagery the symbolism, the metaphor, at least in so far as I interpret it, or like the question how much I resonate with it, not so much. I I guess one uh, one point I, I, I didn't get to make earlier uh, is um, you, you've, you've talked a lot about like how this island is that is this like perfect paradise that provides everything, uh, which to some degree is true. Like no no fear of exposure, no no need to build a fire to to keep warm or anything. Um, no predators but there is like there is an element of like a death that like still permeates you know there's you know uh th these little cute little crabs l running around uh, at, at the beach all the time they like you know pick and eat at you know uh, uh, uh whatever like uh, comes in front of them like 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 carrion uh yeah there's a uh, that you know flies buzz over like uh, dead animals uh, there's, there's a scene early on where uh, where the man finds a, uh, a washed up uh, dead seal, uh, which like he he touches and a, a wound opens up on it, and he almost he almost vomits. Um, uh, yeah, there's also yeah. A, a really interesting montage right after he's washed up. After I think the second time his bro boat is broken apart, yeah, when where he's very depressed, it shows it shows a crab getting a dead fish out of the ocean. Then it shows a spider creeping up on a fly caught in its web. And then we see the man kind of stranded on the island. I think maybe you could read that as an incredibly misogynist way that like this woman character is ensnaring this man and trapping him <laughs> on the island. But I uh, it, it does feel like it, it does feel like at least that scene is imparting this kind of yeah, this nature is this kind of force is working against each other. Because like we say, even though it's a perfect island, the tsunami still comes and like overruns the land briefly. But nature can still grow back from it. But it is is this kind of like you're right, these 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 forces working against each other, this lingering of death, because eventually he dies in the end, our, our main character. So there is, yeah, this idea that it's it's still fragile. It's still like, I know, I guess, you know, you say part of, you know, the circle of life, human experience, working yeah. that in. And, and if you want to get back to the whole like Garden of Eden uh, parable idea, uh, that, that's very like, w w which is obviously like a part of the of, of the movie's like uh, thematic uh, bones. Uh, you know, especially with what we talked about with um, with this, this shame that 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 uh, that she, uh, she the woman experiences, uh, and um, it's like it it would be a Garden of Eden, except like n knowledge of death and like decay. Is like already like very much present. Like like the part of the reason why these two characters meet each other is that he like basically like uh, kills this uh, this red turtle in uh, in revenge. That's a, like just sit there ba baking in the in, in the sun for for like a full day or something. Uh, and it's it's you know I mean we're getting that, that's pretty real here, and right? raw in a, in a way that like uh, Garden of Eden wouldn't really be. I, I think it's true. But also, like, we're kind of getting into complicated questions here because is the reason they meet because he killed the turtle or is the reason they meet because the turtle destroyed his rafts? And I guess I really want to get into the question uh, of 
what turns her into a human? And I don't just literally mean, oh, she was killed and then she just turns into a human. But like, what 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 are we taking from this metaphor? Is there continuity between the turtle and the woman? Is there not? Is, is this like a symbol, his embodiment of his regret, changing his view on nature and on life on this island? Or, you know, just does he value the life of the turtle as much as he would value a human's life? And that is what is coming to pass here. I, I just wonder about that, and I guess I I'm know, curious may- about what you think. Maybe this is a fairy tale creature that uh, that we have long forgotten existed once. You know, a, a fairy tale uh, creature, the, a giant red turtle, which uh, which, which only like like uh, transforms into uh, into this beautiful woman form when uh, when when someone ex- expresses anguish over them or something. You know, it's. I mean, I find that very unsatisfying. As a, I, I know it's yeah. unsatis. I know, no, it's not satisfying. I don't. I don't have a satisfying answer <laughs> to what exactly the the red turtle is, what exactly the woman represents. But like, I, 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 that doesn't mean that, like, that the the allegory isn't like some something that that like feels uh, like meaningful. Maybe maybe it, it's meant to be so like uncertain because of, because a lot of these like classic fables have have this level of uh, of abstraction of uh, of things not quite making sense but like that that's part of what makes it magical I, uh, think- I, I, I feel like I'm, I keep answering your like your inquiries into the the, the thematic uh, stuff going on in the movie with you know shrugs <laughs> <laughs> because uh, because it just doesn't feel as like essential to me when I watch this like ma- masterful like dialogue free uh, just pure animation cinema uh, in front of me. Uh, like, I, well, I guess it's just not those questions that run through my head. But like you said, like it's not like you you analyzed your way to to not being fond of the movie. You had your experience with it and your reaction and, and your like thinking it through i had my reaction which is like it, it made me tear up the first time I, I saw it i still remember like just this weird sensation of like the, these like strong emotions that were just you know there you know like, like and trying to like really dig into the uh the how and why of it feels like you know picking apart a a symphony for, for what it says about society i don't i don't, I don't know I, so I, it, I, it, it it says uh it, it says look at the, the look at this ocean well, I do want to pick apart symphonies, what they say about society. But it has yes, a more specific reason why I'm asking. Um, because in the ending, uh, of course, she turns it back into a turtle and leaves. So I was kind True. of trying to ask the question, okay, how, what exactly is like the allegory or metaphor or like the tone or the emotional weight of her turning human and then turning, you know, not human anymore, I guess. Uh, to attach it to my own speculation, it's like the sustained nature metaphor, right? Because we know turtles can be very, very old. They can outlive humans by far. And what I think is um, helping here is that this indeed impresses like more of a notion of the turtle being nature incarnate, right? Like there is a moment at which he experiences true empathy with a creature you know, such as a turtle, where he recognizes, oh shit, I, I killed it, or rather, maybe killed it, whatever, you know. And no, yeah, that, that's what that's what it, he he regrets, like causing its death. It, it is dead. Yeah, and so it point. humanizes for him, right? Like, so it humanizes for him because he starts feeling empathy with this creature. And I feel like since turtles outlive humans by far, there's this sort of notion that we should have a deep respect and love and cherish the nature which will long outlive us which we are only a part of you know which we only exist with and in and removing all of the other context from you know their relationship love having a child which complicates this because like how can you have her be the metaphor for nature purely when they actually have a child and the child is a human who leaves to go live with humans presumably but leaving all of that aside i think that is a very uh, noteworthy and interesting thematic message that i also sort of resonate with like the idea that this really old turtle will long outlive you, but it still like will remember its time shared with you, and that you should have a sort of humility before nature and you know with how we humans impact nature. So you know, I think the movie goes too far in basically taking all of the human civilization making away. But the point that we humans should 
uh, have more of an empathy towards nature and natural life, that is a well-taken point, and I think also a well-delivered point. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. So, you know, a couple more tree houses, and this would have been a 10 out of 10, I take it. Um, probably not a 10. I mean, it would have to have a yeah, yeah, I'm, community I'm, I'm, as well. <laughs> But like, it's called hyperbole, yeah. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> but in the group chat, if I were to engage in a little bit of speculation, I found like a lot of potential in one particular scene, which was uh, the son wanting to leave the island. I would have kind of found it interesting if after the tsunami, the family decided, okay, we, we can't live here. We need human society for our own safety. Then built a raft together. But in the last moment, the mother would have jumped off and turned into a turtle and disappeared. And the two would be like, oh, shit, uh, mom, no. And they would leave to society because humans have to live with society. And all of this love and this deep experience of nature would have remained as like, you know, a beautiful moment in your past. But nature cannot come with you into civilization. But humans need civilization, if that makes any sense. But society is difficult to animate, Yard. It is. But it's true. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of buildings. You can't animate cars anymore. They'd all be CG. It wouldn't look so good. Um, I do think, though, that... Your thing of saying like the the turtle is definitely like nature in, in incarnate, which I'm still not sure on, depending on the how you view it. It does bring up like an interesting aspect, like I said, with the um the way that the turtle clearly has these needs, this fulfillment that it wants with this life for the man. Because it's like if it was just about respecting nature and it mem um, having a memory of us after we're gone, the entire movie could have gone with just the turtle being a turtle that he befriends. But because it becomes a woman and like starts this family with him, it almost kind of implies from that perspective that like nature also kind of needs us in a sense. That like it kind of suffers this fundamental loneliness that we understand as well, which again might just be like trying to be a human narrative, but using nature as a um a force in the story. I mean, but I, I think you can also interpret it in that way of like, do do all creatures like deeply need something in that way? Because we know plenty of creatures, uh, animals of, of all kinds, are collective. Like they 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 search out groups and they don't do well on their own, even if it's just for pure survival reasons. Many animals operate in packs or in you know cloisters or whatever. Uh, so I think in the movies also getting at something like that of a of not just a human loneliness, but a universal need for living things to be with them with each other to like connect and be around each other to kind of like that is the experience of life itself is being with other living things yeah and, and so, isolation itself is kind of a death well so uh -huh. when the woman is alone after after the man dies of old age she returns to be a turtle because there's nothing there to be together with and so the humanity fades i guess that, that, that would make sense i, guess. I mean I'm, I'm kind of happy i set this up this way because like all of the points you're making i find very interesting but i feel like i've already kind of got into the question of why i don't think they quite work out like that right like for example um if you know there is this idea of i'm kind of losing my point here if there's this idea of like beings should be with other beings right Humans should be with society and not completely isolated, right? Nate, does nature need us? You posited that, Hipster. Does nature need us? Well, my answer was, in this movie, there's a really huge disinterest in the ways in which uh, a, a symbiotic relationship could exist between humans and nature. The only point we make about living with nature is you can have as low of a footprint as possible because basically not take too much from nature, right? I don't think that is nature needing us. I think that is us needing nature and us not contributing anything to nature. I think the way humans contribute to nature is exactly the Takahata way, right? Like we create landscapes. We create certain modes of nature. We allow certain animals, certain plants, certain biodiversity to continue existing despite catastrophe because of our human work. But that's not in the movie. So I don't feel like it's actually nature needs humans. And I don't think it's about the idea that humans, you know, and beings should live with other beings either. I think that's both points kind of not working out for me in the thematic reading here. Well, I think that's more specifically down to what you view as fundamentally human. Again, we're, we're getting down to more like your personal feelings about things in the world, like conflicting with other people's like readings of the film, where I guess you specifically view humanity, you're right, as this this building creature you know this we, we create societies we we farm the land as almost part of our nature which I, I kind of agree with i don't necessarily know if 
my feelings about the world and humanity and nature are represented in this film. But I do think the film wants to at least impart that kind of idea, this kind of universal need for living things to commune. And I think as your point about like leaving the lowest footprint, uh, I still feel the sun uh, of the two of them operates in that space the most. Because again, as we see, he's like this weird turtle souled person where like he lives on a boat, but we don't know if he's going to human civilization. He probably will be. But if he decides to stay there or if he decides to go back and live with turtles, because he clearly like has this deep connection with them, we, we don't know. And it's left purposely open and unanswered. So I think the sun is meant to represent this kind of question of can there be this symbiosis? Can there be this person who lives between these two worlds? who can understand both sides of the ocean and the land uh, and like what, what side would they be happy with, I guess is up to your own interpretation and like deliberation from watching the movie. Yeah. No, I think one thing um, you're, you're getting at, you know, just like, yeah, yeah, it would actually have been like relatively easy to like reconstruct the movie with just like a bit more of that, like building and, and making and adapting nature to you instead of just adapting to the natural environment if if instead of like just seeing the family just like gathering more shells maybe like just a just a quick look at them having made this like enclosure where where they grow these oysters or something just some some elements of that would add that element of like of creation of like remaking the environment which which you consider and and yeah this is true it's like very very big part of being a human and a very part a very big part of any natural environment in which humans have made their home um but that would have that would interfere with this sense of tranquility with this like with this untarnished image of uh, of 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 this of this beach of the of this uh, ecology of 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 this ocean and it's just i i guess the filmmakers just were weren't really interested in in that. I mean, and I that's, agree. Uh, yeah, and, and and that and you can you can take that and and be like, yeah, well that that sucks. I wish they were interested in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or, I, or, or, <laughs> or you can be like, oh man, I love I, I I love the vibes. Give me give me those vibes. They uh, they they feel great, and I had a great time watching it. And like that's I mean that's up to the uh, the viewer, I suppose. Yeah, I I guess I I guess I just have like. I feel like this is reaching the concluding point of me trying to elaborate my criticisms, but I guess I'll just sum it up like this, like finally. You are, of course, completely right that I am asking it to deliver an idea, a message that it didn't want to deliver, that it wasn't interested in, right? Like, So I'm projecting, of course, what I think human life is about onto it, right? Uh, that is only my way of sort of expressing... And I I don't like to be the guy who like makes up alternative endings, even though I have made that right. But uh, but it's all just kind of my attempt to communicate why it doesn't connect with me in that way. Because I really value humanity, progress, society, civilization, living together in a community. You know, with all the achievements that has, even from the standpoint of sustainability. Because I think you know human nature is this homeostasis which will sort itself out and will return to a beautiful stability if we just leave it alone, if just the evil human stops interfering with it. And you use the word tarnishes the untouched island or something like that. Uh, I don't see human interference in nature as tarnishing necessarily. And I think that is why I resonate so deeply with Studio Ghibli movies like from Miyazaki and uh, uh, Takahata because they both have a notion of human interfering with nature in a way that isn't tarnishing but that changes our perception of nature that changes nature itself sometimes there's a tragic loss involved as with many Miyazaki works but ultimately there is a sense in which humans sustainably have civilization with nature instead of you know the I want to be mean and call it naive vision of a utopian perfect island where humans just live without leaving a footprint on nature but you know that's just me and my thoughts on ecology sustainability humanity you know basic ideas like that <laughs> well what, what, what is a garden of eden if not naive well to be I fair suppose. yeah yeah uh, i i completely agree on like an ideological level Nyard. uh and to make a timely reference this is my exact problem with avatar as well avatar 2 the one that just came out because we have water yeah, because it was just this kind of very naive fairy tale like thing where like, oh, we just live perfectly in commune with nature and there's no bad things, there's no predators, there's no disease, uh, only bad machines and humans cause pain and suffering and it's just very childish and uninteresting. 
Uh, but I feel like this movie does it a lot better where, again, because it's so vague, so unspecific and like like more magical and more um, strange, I feel like it allows you to kind of put in whatever emotions and like your ideas about humanity into it uh, a lot easier. It's more and more, this, this is more of like a very beautiful raw shark test is how I do, would describe this movie. <laughs> like uh, it's very nice to look at, very pleasant, um, but you know, you can take away very different meanings depending on exactly uh how you view things and i just kind of like try to appreciate the movie as it is as opposed to what i would prefer it to be yeah it, it, it's pretty interesting that you point point to avatar the way of water uh, a movie which i had an absolute blast watching because uh, i guess similarly like it like it's not as like interesting or agreeable when like thinking about it like digging into it on a textual thematic level um but similar to Avatar: The Way of Water, the Red Turtle is just just a great like experience, just as, as a film goer uh, and like a, a film. I disagree. Lover. That movie is fucking boring. It's like three <laughs> hours long. I could not could not stay awake. Okay, uh, well, this, this is not this is not a, our discussion. And, of, and really beautiful. Okay, yeah, it's right. not a discussion of, of that movie. I'm but, just uh, pointing out that similarity. That, I feel like we've yeah. we've said pretty much everything we can say. Yeah, I, I, I suppose so. And that, that that would be my final thought. That like what for for whatever like uh, weird ambiguities and uh, unfortunate subtexts uh, and all that which uh, which is absolutely fair to uh, to to discuss and uh, and fair to criticize and fair to like dislike the movie for i i just as a again as a as a film lover just on a purely like aesthetic level just on a on on, on the level of just feeling these emotions like uh, emanating through the art uh, which which feels so like distilled and pure and like essential, that that that's what makes this movie uh, great in my eyes, uh, and uh, and that's you know that's my two cents, I suppose. I understand and respect your perspective because I agree that the cinematography and the craft is incredible, as we've mentioned many many times in this movie. As we're nearing the end of the podcast, I do want to quickly shout out. Uh, the son of Michael uh, Dudokdewit, which is Alex Dudokdewit, who uh, is in interesting ways, uh, kind of in other ways related to uh, the Nausicaa, Nausicaas and uh, Ghibli stuff, because not only is he the translator of the new release of Miyazaki's manga, Shuna's Journey, interesting connection there, but he also wrote the entire ass book of the, you know, BS BFI uh, what's it called? Institute for Film, a British film institute or something about Grave of yeah. the Fireflies, which released two years after we made our episode on Grave of the Fireflies. So it isn't one of our sources, but it would have been a prime source if we, you know, had it at the time. So that's some cool connections that we have here that show that the DeWitt family uh, seems to be a uh, big into Studio Ghibli, just like us. So you know, I think on that on that layer, we do deeply resonate with each other still. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so, yeah, and maybe what's next? Because, like, this was a bit special. Like, uh, we still need... Oh, oh no. Oh, no. I, I think I remember what's next. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah, you remember. Say it. Uh, next time on the Norsecast, it's uh, Earwig and the Witch. Talking about gratuitous and ugly CGI. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Here we can the witches up next. Oh no. Uh, so the next film by Goro Miyazaki, Hayao Miyazaki's son, and the first full 3D CG film, feature film by Studio Ghibli. Um, we'll get into that next time. Hopefully we can get back into a schedule where we can actually have one of these a month. So that will be next month, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> we we might be pretty bad at sticking to schedules. <laughs> yeah. But uh uh at any rate, we are we are reaching the tail end of uh, you know feature films produced by uh, by Studio Ghibli or distributed by them. So uh, I guess uh, we will uh, we will see what happens after this uh, this next one. Right, because um, until Miyazaki yeah. releases uh, How Do You Live, which will be this year, um, yeah, I think it's July. July, yeah, and uh, but there's still a little bit of a gap between now and July. So we will be figuring out how to uh, supply this podcast with more content until then, I suppose. Um, we've we've already been pushing around a few, few ideas because, you know, Yerwick and the Witch is just going to be the last movie um, at uh, to this date from Studio Ghibli. So 
that's where we will not end this podcast, but we will try and, uh, you know, come up with cool new things to do. So look forward to that. But for now, stay tuned for Earwig and the Witch. And I hope we can have a very uh, surprisingly positive discussion about this movie because I have not seen it yet. So it will be the first Ghibli movie that I will only uh, see. Neither, because of... neither have I. I okay. pray that we can get it out before How Do You Live comes out. That should at least be our goal. Yeah, we should, yeah, we and, should uh, be on just time be... when How Do You Live comes out. Like We should release it as soon as there's translations for us. Hell yeah. Uh, also, just, just to be clear... Um... We, we, uh, I'm not judging a book by its cover. I have, haven't seen the Awake either. I'm judging it by the reviews uh, <laughs> oh, that, no. that came out. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I guess there's nothing else for it but to, uh, but, but to get to get to watching and get to thinking. And uh, and for now, it is time for our, our, for the three of us to uh, transform back into our uh, reptilian forms and uh, return to the ocean of the internet from which we came. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Beautifully said. Bye bye. <laughs>